matter in that sense. We're living that way because that's the way we want to live. And after all, that's the best way, isn't it, to wait for a kingdom that we don't know the, 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 the starting date of. Because if that's our attitude, then the, the date becomes irrelevant. I want to live that way. I want to live with Christ as my king, so I'll live that way now. I will live as, with Christ as my king. And if he comes tonight, or if he comes in 30 years' time, or if he comes a thousand years after I'm dead and buried, it, it really doesn't matter. It'll be wonderful when it comes, and the sooner it comes, better. The, the sooner the better. But I want to live like that. I want to live under him, and therefore I'll live like that now. And, and that spirit is what Matthew 25 is all about. So we come then tonight to this parable of the talents. And it's a bit of a classic parable, isn't it? It's, it's actually the, lo the second longest parable of all of Jesus' parables. Who, what's the longest parable? Who can tell me that? Maybe one of our younger ones can tell me. What do you reckon is the longest of Jesus' parable? Or maybe one of the older ones. I think it's his most famous parable. No, not the sower. <laughs> of course not. Yes, the prodigal son, of course. Thank you, Robbie. It's not the sower, it's the prodigal son. Famous one, and, and that's the longest one. And this is the second longest of the parables. And it's quite similar in structure to the parable of the pounds, which was in Luke 19. That was given a few weeks earlier, a bit of a different parable with a different lesson, but similar sort of structure. Now, let's just, first of all, just get our head around the story. And I'm sure this story is quite familiar to many of us, but maybe particularly for some of our younger ones, you might think, oh, what's the parable of the talents about? It's a fantastic little story. And that's a breakup of what the, uh, the story is about. What the master did, how the servants responded to what he did, and then how he responded to their response. That's basically what the story is. So let's just firstly review very quickly as a story, and then we look at the lessons. Most of our nights spent on, on the lessons behind it. So, verse 14 and 15 says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man travelling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods, and unto the one of them he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, and to everyone, to everyone according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. So here's a man, he's going to go into a far country. He's going to be gone a long time. In fact, in verse 19 it says he went away for a long time. So away he goes and um, similar, similarly to what we saw in the parable of the, ta the ten virgins two weeks ago where the bridegroom tarried. But this man goes away for quite a long time and he gets his servants together. He gets three of his servants together and these servants, it's the Greek word doulos which means a slave or an attendant. And in the, in the Roman Empire, slavery, sometimes we think slavery is all about ethnicity, right? So if someone's of a particular race, they become a slave. But in those times, it wasn't quite like that. Because what happened was a country would take over another country or there'd be someone would fall on hard, some businessman would fall on hard times. And what, what, what it meant was that sometimes slaves were quite capable and highly qualified people, business people who are experienced in management and, and you know, arranging financial affairs, quite qualified people. And this appears to be the case here. These are not just three slaves doing menial tasks. These are quite responsible people. And this man's putting them in charge of aspects of his business. And he distributes to them talents. Now, what does that mean? It's the Greek word talenton, which means a weight made up of a sum of money. So. Forget the word talent, just think it's a, it's a weight of money. Some say it's the heaviest weight that a man could carry. That's what one uh, talent was. And in fact, apparently our word talent that we use today as an ability comes from this parable. Around about the 13th century, the word people started using the word talent for ability. But anyway, that's, that's where it came from. We'll look a little bit later what it represents. But for now, just let's understand it's a weight of money. Some people say, one reference I looked at said, a talent is $1,000. Another reference I looked up said, a talent is $1.7 million. <laughs> so um, or apparently it depends if it's gold or silver or whatever, you know, copper or whatever. So anyway, the value is irrelevant. It's an amount of money which you weigh, one 
talent. And he gives it out according to their ability in verse 15, or as uh, Weymouth translates, uh, according to their capacity. So that's what he did. That's what the master did. Now, how did the servants respond to that? Well, in verse 16, he that received five talents went and traded with the same and made them five other talents. And likewise, he that received two, he gained another two. So they traded. In the Greek, that means to toil or to work. A couple of different translations say they employed them in business. So they got busy. And both of those servants doubled the money. Ah, but the, the third servant, verse 18, he that received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. Now, that was apparently a fairly common practice at the time because if you, it's not like today where you could put money in the bank and it would be safe there. If you had you know, a bag of money and some, some power is going to invade your country, what are you going to do with it? People would bury it and just note exactly where they'd buried it so they can go back later on and find it. Remember, Jesus had a, in Matthew 13, he had a parable of the hidden treasure. So that was the basis of that. It was a fairly common thing to do. Convert your assets into something small and portable and that you can bury safely in some sort of box. Anyway, this guy, that's what he does. He just buries it. And it's interesting in verse 18, it says, He that received one went and digged in the earth. Now, in verse 17 and or in verse 16, it says, The one with five talents went. And then so did the one who with two talents. They, but that's a different word. In verse 16, it's a Greek word that means to travel or to journey. So the new, uh, the, the NET Bible says those first two went off. So they went somewhere, busy, started a business, whatever they did, bought and sold land. But in verse 18, the word went means to just turn aside. And the NET says he went out. The others went off. He just went out. So it just emphasises there just how little he did in contrast to the first two servants. So that's what they did. Now we come to the third section on the screen there. What was the master's response to the servant's response? Well, in verse 19, after a long time, he, the Lord of those servants come and reckoneth with them. Um, several translations I looked at said he settled accounts with them. It's a commercial term. So there's a business meeting. We're going to have a business meeting and see how everyone's gone. He's going to discover how commercially successful these servants were. And when he discovers that two of them doubled their money, in verse 21, his Lord said unto him, the first one, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And he says the same thing in verse 23 to the other faithful servant. The word faithful is a Greek word meaning trustworthy. So this master commends them and promises them even greater responsibilities in future. But the third servant, very different. In verse 24, he that had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed, and I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. He says, I knew you were a hard man. Weymouth renders that a severe man. He virtually blamed the master himself for being so hard that he scared him into burying the money. But of course, the master saw right through that and, he, and in verse 26, the Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchanges and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. So he says, you're wicked. You're wicked for accusing me of being such a hard, unreasonable man and you're lazy. You were lazy with the money. If you thought I was so unfair or so demanding, so stringent, then why wouldn't you at least stick it in the bank and earn some interest? You're, you're just lazy. And so he takes it off him and gives it to the servant with ten talents and casts out the third servant. And so ends that little story. What a great little story that was. So now what we want to do is have a look at all of the lessons behind that little story. So let's go back now and consider those. Now notice in verse 14, it said, it started with the word for. 
for the kingdom of heaven. So that's a linking word that links the parable to the previous parable of the ten virgins. Um, uh, the ESV, the revised version, of quite a few translations, instead of the word for, it's got the word why. So it's like, you know, he tell, gives the parable of ten virgins and says, why, the kingdom of heaven is a man, and so on. So it's linking the two parables. And in fact, you can see in verse 14, it says, the kingdom of heaven is in italics. That's not in the original. But you see in 25 verse 1, it says, then shall the kingdom of heaven. So that's why, obviously, the people who put together this version have included that, because they can see that these two parables are linked. They're talking about the same thing. Now, two weeks ago, we looked at the parable of the ten virgins. There they all are, those ten virgins, and we saw that the main lesson behind that parable is that. Our desire for Jesus' return should be such that we remain prepared for it no matter how long we have to wait. So where is the, ten, the parable, that, that parable of the ten virgins taught about being ready, being ready in the face of delay? This parable tonight is all about occupation. What do we actually do while we are waiting for our Lord's return? So let's just put up front a suggested sum, or summary of what, what the lesson of this parable is, and then we'll get into it. So this is what I think the parable of the talents is saying. While we wait for God's kingdom, our faith and love for him must be shown by busily using <coughs> all of the abilities, opportunities and circumstances he gives us in his service. So that's what we're going to see tonight. Now, in verse 14, it talks about a man and his servants. Now, Clearly the man would be the Lord Jesus Christ, wouldn't he? He's going to go away for a lengthy time and then he's going to return one day. And therefore his servants or his slaves would be his followers. And that would be us, those in the ecclesia. And it's interesting that in verse 14 they are described as his own servants. And I said before, it's that word doulos, which means a slave. But that word actually, apparently it comes from a Greek word meaning to tie something up in a knot, to tie it up in a knot. And that's us. We are owned by the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's delivered to them his goods. So he gives to people he owns his goods. And clearly those goods remain his because they're now in the, uh, the, uh, in the hands of people who he actually owns. He's entrusted them to people he owns. And you can see throughout the parable, notice this, you might want to colour this in. I've got it coloured in in my Bible just so it jumps out. But this is right throughout the parable. It's all about everything is the master's, right? It's his own servants. At the end of verse 14, they're his goods. Verse 15, he gave them to them. Verse 16, they received from him. Verse 18, they received it. At the end of verse 18, he hid his Lord's money. It wasn't his money. It was his Lord's money. Verse 20, he that received five talents. And that man says, Lord, thou deliverest unto me. Verse 22 again, the one who had received talent. He said the same thing. I got them from you, Lord. Thou deliverest unto me. Verse 24, he that had received the one talent. Verse 25, he at least admits it was your talent. And that lo, there thou hast that is thine. Verse 27, you should have put my money to the exchanges, and then I would receive my own with interest. Verse 28, um, take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him, uh, to that other man, and then uh, verse 29, to, um, unto everyone that hath shall be given. So Jesus just emphasises over and over again, everything belongs to the master. He wasn't giving money to these slaves, and then it's theirs to do with what they want. No, no. He owns the slaves, therefore he owns what they own. And he's entitled to have something back from them. Everything belongs to him. And we are in that situation. Now. We are the Lord Jesus Christ's people, looking after his goods on his behalf for a time of his choosing. And um, we've got no right 
to do anything with those things other than what he would do with them, because they're his, and we are his. Now, what are these goods that we've been given? This is really the heart and soul of the parable, isn't it? What do those talents actually represent? Now, we've seen in the story that the master got the three servants and he gave to them different amounts of um, money based on their capacity, right? He gave to each of his servants something that they had the capacity to do something with to further the master's cause. That's what he did. And I think what that's representing, therefore, is anything that the Lord Jesus Christ puts into our life which we can use to bring him honour. Now you can see on the screen there I've listed that as three things, for example. Abilities, of which you know, we've all got different abilities. Opportunities, so that could be specific moments in our life, just times in our life, particular events that happen. And finally, circumstances, of which there's obviously a massive variety of different circumstances. The country that we live in. How much access we have to the Bible. We have virtually unlimited access to it. The ecclesia we attend. Whether we're healthy or whether we are sick. Whether we are um, got quite a bit of wealth or whether we're quite poor. Whether we are married or single. The size and circumstance of our family. How much time we have on our hands. Our age, whether we're young, middle-aged or now we're elderly. All of those things are circumstances in our life. The variety is endless. And all of those things, our abilities, our opportunities, and our circumstances are things that Jesus has put into our life that can, or if we decide not to, not to use in his service. And now you think of those circumstances in life, they, they can be things that are uh, positive or negative. So you take the example of money. So we'd say, well, if someone's got a lot of money, and you know, relative to the rest of the world, we've all got a lot of money, but some more than others, and we'd say, well, obviously, if someone's got you know, a lot of money, they should use that money in the service, in, in God's service, service of the ecclesia. But what if someone really struggles financially? That struggle is itself a talent, not an ability, a talent, something that's given to them that they can do something with. How that person handles poverty in their life can be a living exhortation to other people in the ecclesia, other people who might also be in their circumstance, or other people who might have a lot of money and look at that person and think, you know, I've got way more than that person, and yet look at them, look how happy, look how contented they are. And they still use what they've got, you know, in the surface of the, of, of the ecclesia. That could be an exhortation to someone who's got no money or who's got a lot of money. Someone who's in a similar circumstance or not. And so, if that brother or sister who hasn't got a lot, but handles that, that trial in life in a faithful way, they have multiplied that talent. Because they have used that circumstance to help other people. You know, that happens all the time, doesn't it, in third world countries particularly. How many times have we, have we had people who've gone over to do mission work in, in very poor countries and come back and they say, you know, I got more, I, got more, I think I, they helped me more than I helped them. I remember when, when um, I've only done this once, when, when I went to India with, um, with Jack and we went to this, um, or this Bible school and there was this old couple, very old couple who... They didn't hardly speak a word of English, but they, someone said to us, oh, they, they want you to come back to their house after when the Bible school's finished. So we went there with Brother Milton Richardson and um, a couple of other people, and I thought, this is going to be really poor. This will be a really poor little house. And, and it was a room. They lived in a little room in a shocking part of town, filthy part of town. And the room they were in would have been about, would, it would have been not quite as big as the kitchen of this hall. It really wouldn't, it lit, quite literally, be smaller than that kitchen. And there they were in this little room, just a room, and they'd been living there um, for over 50 years. They'd raised four children who are now, four sons who are now adults, m moved away. They'd, all their life had been in that little room, and it was just amazing. And we sat there with them, and, it, and you know, you think, well, 
if, if they could see the, the way we live, it would be just embarrassing. And so we, we there's a person, and, and actually, you know, we sat there, we did the readings, and then he actually got up and prepared us a little meal, a very simple little meal, but it, you know, it would have been a costly thing for him to do. And it was an amazing thing. Now, I look back and think, did it change my life? Well, <laughs> I'm not sure it did, but to my shame. But, you know, that, that's a talent, isn't it? That, that's, a, that's a something, that's a capacity that God has, that person has got. And he's using it for good. Not that he's trying to you know, show us how poor he is to help us with our riches. He wasn't thinking like that at all, clearly. But there's a person who's faithfully handling a dif difficult circumstances in life, and that is what he's been given by God to use that in a faithful way. And he most certainly is doing that. So these talents are not just positive things in our life. They could be things like poverty or sickness or loneliness, or lack of confidence, or depression, uh, or family division, or family tragedy. All of those things are things in our life that can be used to further our master's cause. And how we respond to that circumstance could be very profitable to God and very helpful to our brethren and sisters. You know, another example could be we might, we might observe someone who has experienced some um, tragedy in their life, and it might be a faith. We might look at them and see there's a faithful brother or sister who has experienced that tragedy and has still maintained their faith in God. And we wonder, would I be able to respond that way if that happened to me? Would my faith be that strong if I went through that? Well, perhaps. God allowed that faithful brother or sister to experience that tragedy to make others ponder that very question. Whether God brought it about or whether he just allowed it to happen, whatever the circumstance, he has allowed that brother or sister, that faithful brother or sister, to experience that so that other people might look at that and, and, and put that in their life and think, how would I respond to that? How would I go? And, and you know, do that self-examination. What a capacity that is! That's a that that would be a that's a five talent capacity, isn't it? That one. Surely that would be that. So these talents aren't just abilities, are they? Even though they can include abilities, if we think of them as abilities, we it's the problem is then we think, oh well, I've someone I, I haven't got any ability. Someone the other people have got a lot more ability than me. Well, that might be well true, but we've all got circumstances in our life. No one hasn't got circumstances in their life. They might be the similar to others, they might be very different to others. They might be totally unique, but we've all got them. And the point of this parable is do something with them. Do something with your circumstances for God. And when you think about it, the very fact that we are all different people is worth um, thinking about as well. In verse 15, the master knew the capacity of each of his servants. They all had some capacity, but they all had different types of capacity. And as the parable goes on to show, the master didn't consider one more important or valuable than another because the faithful servants were given identical commendation, even though one of them produced a lot more money than the other one for him. So we are all different. And it's human nature, isn't it, for us to look at people who are different to us and either envy them or criticise them. And sometimes the, the envy comes first and then the criticism follows. So, for example, you take different roles in the ecclesia. So we're all different in this ecclesia. You might get a, a, a quiet, um, unassuming, unnoticed brother or sister who might be envying other people in the meeting who seem to have more ability and a bit more prominence in the meeting and they wish they were like them. Or that, um, that, that quiet, unassuming brother or sister might look at the, those who are more prominent and because their role is more public and more people see it, they might be very quick to criticise those people for what they say or do. On the other hand, you might get a, a prominent brother or sister who's got some ability that, put, that, that is, is, it makes it more of a public thing. 
things they do are more publicly known. And they might look at a more quiet, unassuming brother or sister and envy them and think they've got it easy. That'd be nice to be able to just cruise along like that in the background. Oh, that, oh, that my life was like that. Or that prominent brother or sister might look down on others for not stepping up and doing the sort of things that they're doing. And all of that is wrong. That's all wrong. Because both of those different types of people have been given different circumstances and God takes equal pleasure from seeing them accept their lot and work in their sphere of activity to glorify God, while at the same time appreciating what other people are doing, which is different to what they're doing. Other people are contributing in different ways. So they're, they're appreciating that as well. Not everyone does the same thing, but we've all got to have the same spirit, don't we? And God has given each of us our circumstances, and he's decided that we have the capacity to give him glory in that circumstance um, better than in another circumstance. And we can be very um, happy to trust God that he's the one to make the best um, decision about that. And that's a very helpful thought, isn't it? You think about that even, to take, forget about ecclesial roles, just thinking about um, in the context of events in life. So all of us at various times in life we experience some sort of trial and difficulty in our life. It's very natural to think, I wish it wasn't so, and I wish things could be different. Our Lord Jesus Christ wished he didn't have to die the way he did. So there's nothing wrong with that. That's just very, very human. But it's a great comfort, isn't it, to know that God has just got us and just slotted us into a position where we can, in our own way, best help his cause. And he's got us in that position. And even if we don't quite understand that fully now, to just know and just to trust that one day we definitely will more fully understand how he's done that. It's a very great comfort to think of that. Another question that, that um, might occur to us as we read this story is why, did Je- why do you think Jesus made the one-talent man the lazy one? Because he could have made the five-talent man bury the, bury the five and the one-talent man, he's a, an industrious person who doubles it. But he, for some reason, Jesus picks the one-talent man and makes him the lazy one. Why, would he, why do you think he would do that? And I think the reason why he does that is that and it's just another great lesson for us, is that it, it's very much part of human nature to think, for people to feel that, or people who feel that they have very little to offer God, um, you know, or, or very little that they can do in the ecclesia, to sometimes retreat into doing just that. And think, well, I, can't, I haven't got much that I can do, and so they actually don't do much, and just sort of withdraw into themselves. But we've all got a responsibility to grow what we have been given, however small or insignificant we might think it is. It's not small to God. And this master got as much pleasure from the extra two talents as he did from the extra five, and as he would have from the extra one if it had been made. What our Lord Jesus Christ wants to see is good and faithful servants. And there might be many tasks in the ecclesia that are beyond me and beyond you, and there certainly would be. But we've got to find something we can do and do it well and do it faithfully. That's what we've got to do, whatever it might be. And our master will be absolutely thrilled to bits with that when he sees that. And another thing to notice in the parable is the urgency that these servants brought to their task. If you look at verse 15... It says at the end of the verse, he he gives them these um, talents according to their several ability and straightway took his journey and then they that received five talents and so on. But almost every translation actually has the word straightway or immediately, not in verse 15 but in verse 16 applied to the slaves. So, for example, the revised version in verse 15 says, he went on his journey... And then verse 16, straight away he that received the five talents went and traded. So the straight away was the servants, not the master going on his journey. 
they immediately went and started to get busy with that money. Now, why the rush? After all, he's going to go away for a long time. They must have known that because he's, he's, that would have been said when he's giving them the money and saying, you know, you, you've, you've got a long time, you're going to have to do something with this money. At that point, they had a long time. He's going away into a far country, so they know they've got a you know, fair bit of time. And yet there's this, this immediacy to what they do. And of course, the answer as to why they do that is because the issue of when the master's going to return is completely irrelevant to these two. These two servants want to work for their master and they want to grow his assets. They belong to him. They, they personally belong to him and what they've been given still belongs to him. So why delay the task? Get stuck into it. That's what they did. Our service to God should not depend on how much time we think we have. At our baptism, we decided to give ourselves to Christ from that day forward, and that is what these, these men did. And remember, the, the, um, the point of these parables is that we live kingdom-like lives irrespective of when the kingdom actually starts. And that's what these two servants did. We live as if the kingdom is already here. And in fact, that exact point comes out in the rewards that these two servants were given. So in verse 21, his Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. The New English Bible puts that this way. You have proved trustworthy in a small way. I will now put you in charge of something big. In other words, the reward of the kingdom is more, if we could put it this way, it's more of the same, but it's bigger and better. The ESV puts that this way. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. So there's a direct relationship between what we do now and what we will do in the kingdom. Jesus is going to say to us, you've shown me what you want to do and what you love to do, albeit in a, in a, in a, you know, a the limited capacity you've got. So now what I'm going to simply do, Jesus will say, is I'm going to remove those limits and I'm going to allow you to be the sort of person that you've always wanted to be in the sphere of activity for which you're obviously suited. Now that came out, if you just go back a page to Matthew 24, the parable of the faithful and evil servants. Verse 45, Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Verse 47, Verily I say unto you, he shall make him ruler over all his goods. So there's a relationship between what he did in this time of probation and what will what he will do in the kingdom. And you could think of any example of that. The, the example I was thinking of was the example of hospitality. You think of hospitality, including the provision of food. And some of our members are very good at that and they, they love to do that and they're good at it. You might be very good at that in the ecclesia and you might be good at it in life, not only in ecclesial events but when someone is unwell or, you know, a sister's had a baby or something, and some people are very uh, quick to provide food and, you know, whatever help they can provide. So all, all that, that sort of, in that spirit of hospitality and care, or when someone is, as I say, when someone is unwell. Now, hospitality, an atheist can be hospitable, there's plenty, plenty of those there, but here's a, a brother or sister in the meeting who has seen hospitality as a way to help someone else in their walk in the truth and a way of furthering God's cause. Um, and what they've done is, is, is invested hospitality with a spiritual import, a spiritual meaning. They've made it their way of serving God and of you know caring for brothers and sisters and bringing them closer together. Now to a brother or sister like that, Jesus Christ may well say, well done. You, you're a person who... You love to be hospitable. You've shown hospitality, hospitality in a small way. I'm going to give you the ability to show that spirit in a far greater way in the kingdom. Now, it might not be involved catering. <laughs> it might be 
you might, that might be your worst nightmare. You've been put in charge of catering forever. But there's a lot more to hospitality than just food, isn't it? Hospitality involves many things. It involves um, you know, being generous, being kind, warm, caring, thinking of the welfare of others. And that might be your, your specialty in the kingdom, just as it is now. And that, whatever task it is in the meeting, that's the sort of thing I think this parable is teaching us. That Jesus Christ is just going to remove the constraints that we, that we don't want in our life now and allow us to be the sort of person that we've always wanted to be in perhaps the sphere of activity that we are particularly suited. We're not all going to be identical, I don't think, in the kingdom. There's all sorts of different things that need to be done. And so he said to them in verse 21 and 23, um, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. The NIV says, come and share your master's happiness. How beautiful is that, isn't it? And it's just simply, again, it's just more of the same, isn't it? The master's saying, you've always shared my delight. You've always shared in the things that I love. You feel the same way about things that I do, about moral issues and about things in life, the things that I value. So come into my kingdom and keep doing just that. That's what he's saying. If we desire to be in the kingdom of God and we, we, you know, we seek to enter that on the right basis, God's going to grant that desire because that's what he wants. We know what it's like to share a happy event with other people who feel the same way about it as we do. It adds to the joy. It's great to be with people who, are, who feel the same way uh, about some happy event that you do. It just multiplies the joy, and God enjoys that too, clearly. He wants to enjoy having people in his kingdom because they love the things that he does, and he'll welcome them in that, into that. But the lazy servant, very different in this case, and we read earlier on in verse 24 and 25 how he came up with this great long explanation as to why he did what he did. It's a lengthy explanation. The first two servants, I counted up, they actually spoke 16 words each to the master. This man spoke 42 words. Too many words, isn't it? There's too much talking going on. He's trying to explain too much. His excuse for doing nothing was that he was afraid of the severity of the master, that the master's standards were too high, so high that he could never meet them. And so he just retreated and withdrew into himself and did nothing. Now, there's a great lesson in that for us, isn't there? We can do that in, in life. If I, if I lack endeavour in serving God, it can be very easy for me to try and sort of cloak that in humble sounding virtue so i might say you know god could never accept me i'm my failings are too great i'm i'm too aware of my sins you know almost as if i'm more aware of my failings than what other people are of their failings making it sound as if it's it's almost a virtuous thing i'm sort of on a higher level than anyone else because i realize how low i am and so I just sort of with, withdraw and retreat and do nothing. Now, that could be genuine humility. It may well be that, but it might just be laziness, actually. It might just be a complete lack of interest, and I'm making it sound very noble. You know, I'm just so aware of my sins uh, more so than what other people are. This slave wasn't humble at all. He just didn't care much about the whole thing, and the master saw right through it. He said, you're wrong to accuse me of being so severe, and you're actually just lazy. You're just not that interested. You, haven't, you don't share the same interests that I do. And so in verse 28, he said, Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents. Now that's interesting, isn't it? The same thing happened in the parable of the pounds in Luke 19 when the, the spare pound was, was given to someone who, who already had... 10 pounds and they actually said in Luke 19 26 but Lord he hath 10 pounds so he gives it to the one who's got the most and that same thing happens in this parable here why why does he oh, and then verse 29 it says for unto everyone that hath shall be given and he that he shall have an abundance but from him that hath not will be taken away even that he hath so what is what does Jesus mean by that and I think we, we have a clue as to what he means by that. We have a very big clue because 
They are the exact words that Jesus said back in Matthew 13, which is about 18 months earlier, when he started using a lot of parables. And his disciples came up to him and said, why are you speaking in these, starting to use a lot of parables? And he said exactly the words of Matthew 25, verse 29, by which he meant on that occasion that those with a childlike faith um, will understand more. They'll understand these parables because of their attitude of mind. Whilst those who have got this cynical, negative, nasty attitude, they're going to understand far less than what they even thought that they did. So there was something, he said to them on that occasion, there's something very sort of natural and inevitable about the whole thing. What you understood was determined by your own attitude. And that's why I'm using parables. And he, now he uses the same explanation here as to why the, the, the talent goes to the one who's got the most. So similarly, I think the point it's making here is that it's, it was quite natural that the extra talent would go to the servant who had the capacity to use it. Just as if someone doesn't take up opportunities that are, that are given to them in life, those responsibilities will in all likelihood be taken up by someone else with the capacity to do so. There's nothing unfair about that. There's nothing, it's just a very natural and inevitable thing, just as it was with those who understood the parables versus those that didn't. And that's why I think Jesus uses exactly the same explanation here in this little parable here. Those two good and faithful servants were both equally commended and equally rewarded, but one of them had greater capacity than the other, and so he was given that extra talent. No doubt, with a responsibility to you know double that one as well, probably. So if we sit back and do nothing in our life in the truth, we'll go backwards. But if we commit ourselves wholeheartedly to God's work, then we will develop that. We'll, that will sort of feed off itself, and we will continue to grow and develop and mature. And that's what is being, I think, described here. Now, two final thoughts before we close, and one is the question of. Um, faith and works or grace and works we know that salvation comes by grace through faith but isn't it true that sometimes the relationship between those two things between grace and our works can sometimes be sort of hard to get right and certainly in this parable the master he made a commercial assessment of each servant's work and he said to two of them well done what you, you've done, he emphasised their works, well done. And to the other lazy one, he said, you should have done more. So the question is, are these two servants in this parable saved by grace or by their works? It seems as though they're measured just on a very commercial basis on their works. But in order to just sort of unravel that a little bit, let's just consider on the screen three very famous Passages. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10. And you can see on those passages what I've done. So grace in white, works in green. Both of these things are emphasised in this verse. By the grace of God, I am what I am. I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Ephesians 2, famous passage. For by grace... You have been saved through faith. And this is, this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And finally, Titus chapter 3, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy. He has saved us. They which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Now, when you look at those passages, you can see the, the echoes of this little parable in those three passages, can't you? How we saw before that the man delivered unto them his goods. Always was it his goods. Emphasising grace. We read in verse, 14, as verse 16 of Matthew 25... <coughs> that they both toiled and worked. So they were, they were the works. 
but they did so with what they'd received from him, they said. So it was grace. In the end, they presented to the master what his gift had produced in them. So it was grace. But in the end, he said to them, well done. So there were works. So grace and works, faith and works, are just sprinkled throughout this parable. And Jesus does that because there's this unbreakable connection, isn't there, between um, our faith in God's grace and our actions. These two faithful servants loved their master and because he and they were faithful towards him because he they knew that he made them what they were. They owed everything to him. They believed in him. And that belief was what caused them to produce a profit for their master. And we might remember the words in James 2 where James says, if your faith doesn't make you do anything, where's the profit in that? There's no profit in that. And these two servants produced profit. But it was a profit because of their love for what the master had done for them. So their works, their profit, and our, our profit is just simply an evidence of what God really wants and what he only wants. He only wants faith. But it's got to be demonstrated by profitable works. And that is why, isn't it, in this parable, in verse 21 and 23, the master says, Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He doesn't say, thanks for the money, now off you go and earn me some more. We don't even see what's happening. The money just sort of now off the agenda. He's far more interested in the servants than he is in the money. One produced five, the other produced two, but he said the same to both. I want you both. I want you two people. I want you both to enter into the joy of, that, that I have. He loved them both because of their faith. And the last little point I wanted to make was just a little point as a positive finish about just the joy of going before the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 20 and verse um, 22, it says, or verse 20, for example, this man goes and, and say, brings the five talents and says, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. One reference I was reading put it this way, and I thought it was put quite beautifully, described that as that the servant had a certain gentle pride, a certain gentle pride that both of those servants had. They don't boast about what they've done. They clearly state where the money came from. It was money that you delivered unto me. And they don't even ask for a reward. But there is an excitement in these two about showing their master what's been achieved with what he's entrusted to them. And when we think about, you know, we go to Christ at the judgment seat, we, we, we ought to be able to go to him with excitement about what we've done with our life in the truth. We, if we do that, that's not a sign that we think we're saved by our own works, our own merit. No one who thinks they're going to be saved by works is going to go excitedly to Christ. They're going to be very, very fearful if that's what they're thinking it's all based on. But if we know that we're saved by faith and not by works, but that our faith was reflected, even in just in a small, very flawed way, as we know it is, very limited way, in what we did in life, then we can go with excitement to that judgment and bring to Jesus what, what we've got and give back to him what was always his, but with a little bit of extra profit on top, which his influence enabled us to gain for him. What a beautiful thing that is. Just like in the master, the master in this parable, our Lord Jesus Christ is not a severe, unreasonable man. He is a very kind and generous man, isn't he? A lovely man who wants more than anything else just to share his joy with people that he loves and who love him. Thank you, Andrew, for that talk on the um, parable of the talents. Is there anyone that would like to ask any questions 
or make any comments about the talk tonight. I'd, I'd like to make a comment. Um, I think Job's a good example of the parable of talents, Andrew. Um, <laughs> That the fact that uh, he was a man that, under his circumstances, lived a, a terrible life, and yet uh, through those circumstances he managed to swing around those friends, and that they would accept the blessing of the offering that he would that he would extend, and through that, God would of course multiply his assets, which is just a good example of. Would you think or? <laughs> and um, I have a question as well um, for Andrew, and that is verse um, 29, just in relation to, uh, sorry, 27. Um, if you could just explain that a little bit more about how that, <laughs> how that connects to the abilities, circumstances and opportunities that uh, applies to the, the um, talents but you could have put that into the money exchanges and earn interest. I'm just a bit confused on that. What, what, what in particular are you confused about? I'm not sure. Well, just that he, he would go, you should have put it into the bank and earn yeah. interest on the talent that you were given. How does that fit in? Or is it just really part of the story? I just think it's part of just saying you should have done done something with what you had instead of doing nothing. Right. Yeah. Is that, no, that's, <laughs> that's all I needed to know. Yeah. It's, there's nothing particularly symbolic about that verse. It's more about just the. It's just part of the story. I think so, but I think that's it's just he's just saying you know you. It's like a panel. Yeah. Well, I think uh, yeah. No, yeah, I just think it's. Um, just saying you should have done something rather than nothing. <laughs> right. Simple as that. But yeah. more no, no, part good. of the story. No, that's good. All right. You can uh, take your, <laughs> your seat now. Um, thank you for uh, everyone coming along tonight. And um, for our next Bible class, it will be Brother John Lawson to the subject of Jacob being part two of the four-part series. Um, should I be announcing that these books are available, Paul? Yes, uh, there's free lampstand magazines. I think it's the current edition. Um, Paul's got a few more than he, he needs. So if you would like to have one for free, uh, just come up to Paul and he's got a few there um, that you can take. And uh, that's really all the announcements. And um, thank you for your attendance. And Brother Paul will also conclude with a word of prayer. Thanks, Paul. If you'd all be up stand. Loving Father in heaven, what a privilege we've had today to come together as brothers and sisters around the table of our Lord this morning. And tonight we've also had a privilege to come together again as brothers and sisters to put into and to learn to, how to put into practice those things that we love. We have the opportunity to be able to become people that love you and we love you because of what you have done for us. You have given us a wonderful hope through your son that he went to that cross and so that we would have the ability to be able to show our gratefulness and our thankfulness by the things that we do. We realise, Heavenly Father, that the things we do are not done to, so that we can save ourselves, but those things that we do in our lives are done purely because we're grateful for what's been done for us. Whether we are a one-talent brother or sister or whether we're a five-talent brother or sister, we all have the ability to be able to use those talents in ways that will help glorify your name but also to help build up the ecclesia. 
And so we pray, please help us to think deeply about those words that Brother Andrew has given to us tonight. And help us to think about those words and to put those principles that we have learnt tonight in our lives. Help us, we pray, to show that we do care about what we've been given. And help us, we pray, Father, to become men and women who want to go into that kingdom age with a desire to help change this world. We pray, Heavenly Father, that that time may be soon. But we also realise that time could be some way off. But again, we pray that you'll help us to keep working as if he may be here tonight. It doesn't matter. We know one day he will return. The signs of the time show us that surely that time cannot be that far away. And so we pray that our faith may shine forth by the way we treat each other and by the way that we love each other. For we know that we are only really showing the love that you have given to each and every one of us. And the only way that we can show our gratefulness for that is to show that love to others. And so we thank you for everything that you have done for us. We pray, Father, that you'll be with our young people. We ask, dear God, that as older people of the Ecclesia, we pray, please help us to look at the young people in this Ecclesia and realise that they're not only just their parents' children, but they're the Ecclesia's children. And that we have a privilege of being able to help them to see those wonderful things that we see. And so we thank you for everything. We pray that tonight may be the last night we have to gather in this hall. We pray tonight an angel may come and take us away to that wonderful judgment seat, a place that none of us should fear, because that is the place where we will receive our reward. It is the place that we want to go to because we want to be given a change of raiment. We want to take off these clothes of mortality and put on those clothes of holiness and righteousness. Please help us, Father, never to fear that judgment seat, but to look forward to it. When we'll look into the eyes of the one that died for us and we pray, he will say to each and every one of us, well done, good and faithful servants. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. We thank you, we praise you through that one's name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.